Good morning. I am the registrar clerk for this hearing. Justice Kampepe and justices of the Constitutional Court, all counsel are online. I call the matter of Secretary of the J Judicial Commission of Inquiry into allegations of state capture, corruption, and fraud in the public sector, including organs of state, and Jacob Gedeshikisa, Zuma, and others for hearing. Council are now invited to place themselves on record. Please note that this hearing is being recorded. Uh, thank you, uh, Justice Kwampebe and members of the Constitutional Court. I appear for the applicant together with my colleague, uh, Ms. Blizzard. Thank you, Mr. Ngai Toby. Yes, Mr. Uh, Ngai Toby. Thank you, Justice Kwampebe. Um, I propose to structure the address uh, to cover five topics. The first is jurisdiction. The second is agency. The third is the merits of the contempt of court. The fourth is appropriate remedy or appropriate sanction. The final one is costs. But before I do that, it is appropriate to set out some brief uh, opening remarks to put the matter in its proper perspective. On the 29th, 28th rather of January, the Constitutional Court granted an order directing Mr. Zuma uh, to obey the summons issued by the commission and to attend and give evidence before the commission. It also ordered him to submit affidavits as per regulation 10.6 of the commission regulations. As we speak today, Mr. Zuma has not complied with that order. He has not attended at the commission and he has not submitted the affidavits as required. But in his failure to comply, he has also adopted a belligerent and a defiant tone. When we came before the constitutional court in December 2020, after a summons had been issued against Mr. Zuma, the target of his belligerence was Justice Sondo in his capacity as chair of the commission. And that was of course after Justice Sondo had ruled against Mr. Zuma in the recusal application. Today, after the constitutional court has granted judgment against Mr. Zuma, the court itself has become the target of Mr. Zuma's angry, threatening, and quite frankly, provocative tirades. Although in one of his public letters, Mr. Zuma talks of an imminent judicial crisis. In reality, there is no such crisis. Our constitutional system provides an answer to what has transpired, even though what has transpired is unprecedented. The legal system contains an answer to it. A person who has intentionally disobeyed a court order is guilty of a crime known as contempt of court. Mr. Zuma is no exception. His status as former president does not protect him from the law. The elements of a contempt of court crime are clear and well established in our law. In this case, we will submit that they have been amply established. One, Mr. Zuma knew of the order against him. Two, Mr. Zuma failed to comply. Three, Mr. Zuma acted in a mala fide and intentional manner. And four, Mr. Zuma has failed to file papers to explain his mala fide disobedience. The commission has asked for a declaration that Mr. Zuma is guilty of contempt. It has also asked for a penalty of two years imprisonment. It has not asked for a fine, nor has it asked for a suspended sentence. There are strong reasons why Mr. Zuma should be imprisoned and he should not be fined and he should not receive a suspended sentence. One, his conduct threatens the entire constitutional order. This court has had many contempt of court applications, but none come to come close to this case in terms of the breadth 
of their attack against the constitutional system. Number two, Mr. Zuma has made public his utterances against this court. Those utterances are unjustified, false, and malicious. Three, Mr. Zuma has drawn in his public tirades against this court unfounded comparisons between this court and the apartheid judiciary, which he must have known to be false. Number four, Mr. Zuma has attempted to discredit this court, its individual members, individual members of the judiciary in general. But number five, and probably most importantly, his conduct must be seen for what it is. We are dealing with a cynical maneuver to avoid accountability. Mr. Zuma has engineered a situation in our submission quite deliberately to escape accountability. The court will remember its own remarks at paragraph 69 of the judgment and paragraph 70, which the court will find at page 78 of the record. And this is what the court concluded in the context of direct access. The respondent, that is Mr. Zuma, is firmly placed at the center of those investigations, which include an allegation that he had surrendered constitutional powers to unelected private individuals. If those allegations are true, his conduct would constitute a subversion of the country's constitutional, of this country's constitutional order. Paragraph 70, it must be plainly stated that the allegations investigated by the commission are extremely serious. If established, they would constitute a huge threat to our nascent and fledgling democracy. It is in the interest of all South Africans, the respondent included, that these allegations are put to rest once and for all. In the way that Mr. Zuma has conducted himself in response to the judgment by this court, in response to the summons issued by Deputy Chief Justice Zondo, he has displayed a cynical attitude to accountability. He has created an environment where he can escape answering to his participation in what is being investigated. And therefore the penalty of two years must reflect this court's disapproval of this type of cynicism, particularly when it is exhibited by a person who was once president of this country and took an oath to comply with the constitution at all times. So where matters stand right now is that the public has been deprived an opportunity to hear from Mr. Zuma, to hear his version, to get an explanation. And where matters stand is that a penalty that will be imposed that we suggest should be reflective of the harm that has been done to the public. If I may then deal with the issue of the jurisdiction of this court, we submit that there are three reasons why the court has jurisdiction. Firstly, this is the court that granted the order which has been disobeyed in this court's judgment in PECO, particularly at paragraphs 13 and 28, it is made clear in our respectful submission that the power of contempt can be seen as a measure by the court to ensure compliance or to punish a person who has disobeyed its own order. So because the court granted the order that is the subject of defiance, there is jurisdiction. Secondly, there is inherent jurisdiction in any event as per section 173 of the constitution because this court has got the power to regulate its own processes. And a disobedience is simply a continuation of the existing jurisdiction that has been exercised by this court. But perhaps most importantly on the subject of the jurisdiction, it is in the interest of justice that this court exercises jurisdiction of over this matter. It is this court's order that has been defined. It would not be fair to ask the high court or a different court to effectively vindicate the authority 
and the moral standing of the Constitutional Court. And particularly in circumstances where Mr. Zuma sought to denigrate the judiciary as a whole. And we would therefore submit that quite apart from the fact that you have an undoubted jurisdiction because you are the court that granted the order, it is also quite strongly in the interest of justice that you should step in and protect the judiciary from an open and quite brazen attack by a former president. And there would be no interest of justice served by a protracted be the inevitable outcome if we went back to the High Court and started contempt proceedings there. So in summary, on jurisdiction, we say you should exercise jurisdiction because it is your order that has been breached, violated in extreme terms. And we say, secondly, that it is not fair to ask the High Court to step in the breach and remedy the situation that has been caused by Mr. Zuma. On urgency, in paragraph 65 of the judgment in S versus Mamabolo, the court already stated that cases of contempt, particularly by public and senior officers, should be responded to swiftly and decisively. That swiftness and decisiveness is particularly required in this case because we are dealing with an ongoing attack on the court we are dealing with an ongoing failure to comply because each day that Mr. Zuma does not come before the Constitutional Court constitute an assault to the rule of law. Secondly, what also brings about the urgency of the case, the name of those utterances should be arrested now. They cannot be allowed to percolate and fit through the body populace, because allowing them to per percolate and to fit through the public as a whole simply creates a quite frankly untenable position where the public is unsure about whether or not the Constitutional Court is willing to protect its reputation, willing to protect its authority, where it has been attacked on quite frankly untruthful and false grounds and thirdly, on the urgency, it is quite clear that Mr. Zuma seeks to exploit his political status and influence in society. And any delay in the hearing of the matter enables him to continue exploiting unlawfully and deceitfully, if one looks at the contents of his letters, his uh, political status. So we would say that on urgency, we are supported by previous jurisprudence of this court that makes it clear that cases of contempt, particularly by senior officials in government, and we would add in this case, a former president, require swift and decisive intervention. Your protection time has expired, Mr. Ngai Tobi. Uh, thank you, Justice Khampembe. Uh, it is the right time because I'm just about to turn to the merits of the case. I already oh, spoke- before, Mr. Nugai, tell me, before you, before you deal with the merits, there's just something that I would like you to clarify concerning jurisdiction. I'm quite alive to the fact that uh, the commission has come to this court uh, to seek a contempt order. My question really is whether there were any alternatives that the commission could have pursued. And this talks on jurisdiction because my question is whether the commission has other powers or powers um, if a witness who has been summoned to appear it before it fails to do so? Yes. Well, there are two questions, I suppose, uh, 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 that uh, Justice Chick flow from that. One is, what are the powers of the commission when a witness has failed to comply with the summons? The commission's powers when a summons has been violated may be to approach a court to enforce the summons, through a civil injunction. 
The alternative may be to lodge a criminal complaint with the police because a non-compliance with the summons constitutes a crime under section six of the Commission's Act. But this is not a case about a non-compliance with the summons. This is a case about a non-compliance with the order of the Constitutional Court. This is way outside the mandate and the powers of the Commission. This implicates the power of the Constitutional Court. And so there is no option when it comes to the non-compliance and the deliberate defiance of the Constitutional Court order. The only place where this can be vindicated is here. The real debate is whether or not we could have gone to the High Court. In that instance, we are not aware of any authority that says that a party may go to the High Court to sue for contempt of the Constitutional Court order. In any no, event, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm aware about that. I just wanted to clarify whether going the contempt route is the only route that was available to the commission. Yes, contempt of the court's order is the only route. Contempt of the summons is not, but we are not here for the contempt of the summons. If I may then proceed to the merits of the crime, this court again is aware that a contempt of court comprises of the disrespect of the authority. Mr. Mr. Ngugai Tobi, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yes. since you have already dressed on urgency and left that issue, the commission is not asking for an order that would seek compliance with this court's order. So the imminent termination of the commission's mandate is irrelevant to this matter as far as this application is concerned and in terms of the relief that the commission is seeking in this matter. So why is the matter urgent from the commission's perspective? The, any contempt of an ongoing nature must be dealt with swiftly and decisively because a, a contempt, especially on these facts that is public and that has invoked the type of language that has been invoked should be dealt with urgently because if you don't deal with it urgently, what you have is the risk of the continued attacks on the judiciary. So that's the first reason why it has to be dealt with urgently. It's to arrest the likely impact on the authority and standing of the court. And so that, are you it, saying that any contempt of court application must be dealt with as a matter of urgency? It always will depend. The facts of this case are quite extreme. There will be many cases. If you take the case of Esfesas Mamabulu, in paragraph 52, they dealing with the contempt that comprises scandalizing of the court. And they say that in those cases, you can always lodge a complaint and the criminal prosecutors would deal with the matter. Then you go later in the judgment where they deal with the kind of contempt we're dealing with here, where there is a, a mandamus directing the performance of an act. And that mandamus is directed against a senior government official. There, they are quite explicit that the rule of law requires vindication swiftly and decisively. So for the most part, contempt of court cases ought to be entertained, generally speaking, urgently because of the likely impact they have on the administration of justice. This case stands apart. I, we went through with uh, uh, my, uh, my, my uh, colleague, uh, Ms. Blizzard, we went through authorities on contempt. I have to say, justice, uh, justices, we have not come across a case similar to this. This is an extreme case of contempt, uh, uh, Justice Teron, which on its own merits does require the immediate attention of this court without delay. I accept your point, uh, Justice Teron, which says that when we began the proceedings, Although in paragraph 81, we explicitly said, it is within your jurisdiction to decide whether or not Mr. Zuma should still be compelled to appear. 
at this point in time, Mr. Zuma did not file an answering affidavit. Where we are at the moment is purely punitive. But even that punishment is something that should not wait any longer because there is a real risk of the threat to the authority of the judiciary as a whole. If I may then come back to the issue of the merits. I've described the crime of contempt of court in the language that has been used by this court in Machabank and in the language that has been used by this court in Ekuruleni municipality and by the Supreme Court of Appeal in the uh, Auditor General case. The crime is the disrespect for the authority of the court. It may take various forms. One of the forms is scandalizing the court. That is where a person publicly insults the court. But the more common form of the crime of contempt is non-compliance with a, an order to perform a certain activity. This case falls under the second, although it has the elements of the first, because Mr. Zuma, in his purported justification, has also insulted this court. Its purpose, the crime of contempt, and I'm covering common ground here, is twofold. Sometimes it is to impose a penalty, but. Ah, uh, so, is having a lot of fun here. Yes, I, I, I have muted Ms. Honorable. <laughs> Thank you, Justice Tepper. Um, the second purpose is ensuring compliance with the court order. The elements that must be proven is that there must be a court order, there must be knowledge of the court order, there must be a failure to comply, and there must be willfulness or intention. Once the first three elements have been established, there is a presumption of malice or willfulness or intention, which may be rebutted by a respondent who places evidence. In this case, what do we know? One, on the 28th of January, 2021, an order is issued. Paragraph four and five are explicit about what is required of Mr. Zuma. He must obey the summons and directives. He has no option but to do so because this court has told him to do so. He must appear and give evidence before the commission on dates decided by the commission. What we also know is that on the 5th of February, 2021, the court order is served on Mr. Zuma. Annexures IM8 and IM9 are the sheriff returns of service. We also know that there is an existing summons against Mr. Zuma, which directed him to appear before the commission on the 15th of February, 2021. We also know that there was an existing, there were two existing regulation 106 directives, which obliged Mr. Zuma to submit affidavits to respond to the welter of evidence against him before the commission. So knowledge of the order is proven, service of the order is proven. On the 15th of February, 2021, Mr. Eric Mabuza, who acts for Mr. Zuma as an attorney, wrote a letter to the commission. In that letter, he made it clear that Mr. Zuma will not be coming they purported two reasons for his non-appearance. The one was that there was a claimed irregularity with regard to the summons, which was never justified. The second was that the summons did not comply with the paragraph four of the letter, I mean, of the order, which also was not complied, uh, explained. And there was then this mention of a review that was pending. Now, both of those justifications were plainly nonsensical. The first one was simply never explained. The second one, which was a pending review, simply overlooked the fact that the review had been before this court and the order had been granted despite the existence of this review. And the law is clear. The fact that you've got a review does not suspend your duty to comply with the court. When you say it was before this court, do you mean this court was aware of it? 
not before. Oh, yes, I don't, I don't mean that. Uh, yes, yes. Indeed, thank you, Justice Madlanga, for the correction. It was not before in that sense. The court was aware of it. It was pleaded before this court. Thank you, Justice Madlanga. So none of those two grounds that were raised by Mr. Mabuza uh, had any validity. They were total contrivance. Mr. Ngugai Toby, what would the impact be if the review application had to be successful? Uh, at some point in the future? It will have no impact uh, on whether or not at the time you should have complied with the summons. Because the summons had to be obeyed. The court order had to be obeyed. The fact that you succeed at a later stage, I mean, this is the point Justice Khampempe was at pains to make in, um, in, uh, in, in the Department of Transport versus Tasima case. The fact that at some stage you may win a case doesn't suspend your duty to comply with a court order. So it has no impact on the contempt. He is still in contempt, even if he won 100 times against Mr. Zuma. But if I understand his objection to appearing before the commission is that the, pres the president, the chairperson of the commission is biased. Yes, th that may be true. You can grant him all of those premises. The bottom line is, as it is clear from Justice Khampepe's judgment in Tasima, once there is a court order, you must comply with it. You cannot choose which court orders to comply with, which court orders not to comply with. So his success in the review application is wholly irrelevant to the contempt of court. Mr. Ngukai Toby, could yes. he apply for a stay or ask to be excused whilst the, the, the review is pending or what? that is before the commission? Uh, no, Justice Mklantla, he has no option in relation to the court order. He has to comply with it. There is no universe in which he can be excused from complying with a court order. He cannot ask for a stay. He cannot ask to be excused. He cannot ask Justice Zondo to excuse himself. There is a constitutional court order. It must be obeyed. This is not a situation where we only had a summons where he could apply to set aside the summons. The judgment of the Constitutional Court cannot be suspended, or he can suspend it before this court if he wanted to, but he has not done so. So as if long he, as this order, sorry, Justice Semplant, I, so I, I spoke of, over you. Sorry, yes. If he had uh, appeared bef uh, before the commission as directed by this court, and whilst once there, explains to the commission that since the review is pending, he requests that the, his uh, evidence be, be stayed or postponed until such time as that review is finalized. Would that be something that you could use in his defense? No, Justice Mkletler, what we say is that he should have been at the commission. And once he's at the commission, he must then comply with the directives issued by the chairperson. And those directives might include stay, postponements, anything that the chairperson would decide. That has not been decided, it's not before you. What this case is about is that he has defied the court order. He has not gone there. He has not even submitted the regulation 10.6 affidavits. And he has told us that he will not. He has also told the court that he would rather go to prison. So this universe we are or, now debating. Or, or what, he might, what, what he might have done which uh, could have resulted uh, in there being no order by us would have been a part A, part B type uh, application when the review was launched, which was not done, of course. Yes, indeed. In fact, he did not even come to the court to talk about the implications of his pending review, to say that the pending review means that I should not go to the commission. But he did not bother to do that. He, in fact, wrote a letter saying, I'm not coming. In this instance, he has done precisely the same thing. So the script is being replayed. So I'm afraid there is no option. He should have gone to the commission on the 15th of February. He did not do so, and he deliberately did not do so. So to try and now find some sort of a justification for him, when he has not bothered to put it under oath here, simply brings about discredit to the institution of the judiciary. Mr. Zuma knows his legal rights. 
he has senior counsel advising him. Uh, you've, you've made reference to the statement uh, by him, the one where he said, uh, I will not comply. Uh, how, is, how is something like that proved in evidence? Uh, I'm not sure if I follow Justice Matlang. I, I mean, for us to accept that as evidence, yes, it's an annexure here. Uh, and and, 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 and uh, some of us may have, some of us may not have uh, uh, read or seen it in the, in the media, but of course what we see or read in the media is irrelevant as proof before, before a court. Oh, so I see. Then is, I'm sure you get me now. Yes, no, I get you. Yes. yes. It's, it's so, so how does it become um, admissible evidence before us? How, how do you prove it? Yes. Justice Matlanga, for purposes of contempt, what we must prove is firstly, that there was a court order. Secondly, that it was served. Thirdly, that there was non-compliance. Thereafter, malice or intention or willfulness is presumed. It can be rebutted if he produces evidence. The three elements are established. We know there is a court order. We know he is aware of it. We know that he did not comply. The, that is enough to establish contempt of court. We don't need any statement. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I get that, I get that. But to the extent that uh, uh, the founding affidavit, your written submissions make reference to these statements uh, by former president Zuma, I assume that reference is being made to them for, for us to take that as evidence. So it's yes. in that context that I raise this but not so much with regard to what elements must you prove to establish contempt, not in that context, but to the extent that there is some value I assume that is thought to be attached to those statements. Yes, there, there is Justice Mazanga, but they are not intended to prove contempt. Contempt is established by knowledge and non-appearance and there's presumption of intention. The relevance of those statements is that they aggravate the penalty. For that very purpose, how do you yes. prove them as evidence? That's my question. Mr. Exactly. Now, we have attached them on affidavit. They can be taken into account. It is enough that we have attached them on affidavit. And the fact that the person who wrote those statements did not come. We do not only rely on his statements. His own letter from his attorney on the 15th says, I'm not coming. And then it contrives two reasons. They simply expand on the justification for not coming. So they are relevant material to establish the aggravation of his conduct. And for that, it's enough that we have attached them to an affidavit. And if anyone wanted to contest them, they could say they are untrue or that they were not written by him. None of that has been produced before this court. So on pure plus con Evans, it's enough that they are an annexure to our affidavit. Well, Katobi, may I, while we're discussing the topic of admissible evidence in respect, in the context of aggravation, um, there's a matter that the amicus raises in their written submissions. They've been asked to file written submissions and if they are admitted, uh, I'd like you to, to consider this. In paragraph 54 of the written submissions, the amicus alludes to the fact that this conduct of, of Mr. Zuma may persuade others to refuse to appear or to abide by the commission subpoenas. Now, as, as, as I read your papers, that wasn't referred to at all in the, uh, in the applicant's papers, as far as I could recall. So what are we to make of that uh, allegation? Surely, um, we cannot take that into account if the applicant hasn't raised it. <clears throat> no, Justice uh, Emachid, the view we take of the matter is that this is not about witnesses before the commission. This is about the authority of the constitutional court. It is something much more serious than a witness who does not show up. What we are concerned with has, has long passed the stage where Mr. Justice Sondo was issuing summons and inviting people. What we are calling the court to take into account for aggravation is what impact will Mr. Zuma's deliberate public 
defiance of the constitutional court have for the rule of law? Well, what exactly. We... Sorry to interrupt you, but well, exactly. And that is why it was pressed before the court, presumably by the amicus. And that is why I raised it in the same context that my brother Matlanga did. Can we take it into account if you didn't allude to it at all? It seems to me that something that must be excluded. We must consider the general impact but without considering this uh, vague assertion of some witnesses who have refused to abide. Yes, I would. I mean, I suppose it's a subset. We would simply say that what we are dealing with is something much more serious is what is the impact on the constitutional court? And we are not dealing with one commission whose term of office will end in June, it will be gone. But the damage that would have been caused by Mr. Zuma's conduct to the standing of the constitutional court will live forever if it is not appropriately punished. And that's the approach we take in the matter. And that's why we don't, I mean, I see what the amicus is saying, but that's not the focus of our attention. The focus of our attention is not Mr. Mr. Zuma's appearance at the commission and the witnesses before that commission. That is one commission whose term of office is about to end. But the constitutional court lives beyond this. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, one last aspect from my side. I know you haven't done with sanction, uh, you haven't dealt with sanction, but something that really concerns me is the approach that uh, the amicus takes. The amicus places heavy emphasis on both punitive and coercive nature of the sanction. And they, they make submissions that uh, there should be some kind of coercion to get uh, Mr. Zuma to go to the commission. It seems to me that you as the commission, uh, uh, when I read, read your papers and, and your argument in it, that uh, you've abandoned all hope of getting Mr. Go Mr. Zuma to the commission. Uh, is, is that correct? So you exclude coercion altogether? Yes, no, it's quite clear that we are excluding uh, coercion. The, the difficulty, well, the short answer to the question is yes, we do not ask for his appearance. We ask for his punishment. What we say is that you should take into account in the decision as to the appropriate punishment that the impact of Mr. Zuma has been a deliberate and a cynical maneuver to avoid accounting. So that's the approach that we take on the matter. Mr. Ndugai told me, just, just on that point, it, it worried me that um, you have abandoned any hope of him appearing before the commission because the main application, the whole basis of the main application uh, was for him to appear before the commission. Yes. And as you rightly said, he had been implicated by certain witnesses and, and, and all of that. Now, if we simply impose a custodial sentence, will that not be counterproductive in the sense that there would really be no point in the whole thing, in the no, whole process? Be, yes, just, sorry, Justice. No, it will not be counterproductive. A punitive sentence is never counterproductive because its focus is the restoration of the authority of the court. What will be counterproductive is this suggestion that Mr. Zuma should go to prison first. Someone must then be sent to fetch him and bring him before the commission. He must then be asked, do you now want to speak or not? That will be ineffective as a remedy. What we are dealing with here also is effectiveness. What is the effective remedy through which this court can vindicate the assault on its dignity? So, a fine is out of the question because we have no knowledge of Mr. Zuma's financial position. He has not come to the court, constitutional court to say that he would rather pay a fine. The only debate is whether to suspend the imprisonment. A suspension was alluded to by us in the founding of David at paragraph 81. We have had no response whatsoever from Mr. Zuma. So the spectacle we fear is the spectacle of Mr. Zuma continuing to run rings around the commission because he is brought today, he doesn't speak, he is brought the other day and the entire thing degenerates into a circus. And this is why a clean, effective remedy that truly vindicates the authority of the court is custodial sentence. Even, even though the, the, the commission will be impoverished in the sense that it will not have the benefit 
of the answers it seeks from him. Yes, J Justice Chitwood, at the moment where matters stand, it is clear that the situation has escalated beyond what the commission could have anticipated. I was asked this question when I came here, I think by Justice Shafter in December. I said it was just unthinkable that anyone would dis defy the order of the Constitutional Court. How wrong was I? Today, we are concerned with another attempt at trying to get Mr. Zuma back to the commission. That simply plays into his exploitative attitude that he has adopted throughout. And that is why the order not only should be effective, but it should also send a clear message to him and anyone else who wishes to undermine the authority of the court. And a custodial sentence is the only appropriate sentence in those circumstances. Well, I was posing these questions, Mr. Mugai Tobi, because I thought that perhaps you could assist the court with coming with the kind of an order that would achieve two purposes, really, to yeah. ensure that um, um, this court shows a dim view to contempt of its orders, but on the other hand, achieving what you wanted to achieve in the, in the, in the, in the beginning. But if you say that there is no alternative order that can do that, then I hear you. Yes, no, Justice Chip, I'm afraid that at this point in time, there is a risk of rendering this court's judgment hollow because it simply creates another round for Mr. Zuma to escape, to pretend as if he is cooperating and then to run away from that cooperation, which on its own, because of the ineffectiveness, on its own brings about discredit to the court's order. We are most interested in an order that will be effective and an effective order is a custodial order. Even if the court were to issue a direction that says uh, he must comply with the summons fully within maybe a few weeks from date of the order, failing which imp uh, imprisonment will then come into effect. No, Justice Santa, that order simply does not work. Mr. Zuma has known for years that there is a summons, so not for years, for months, there is a summons against him. He has told everyone he's not complying. He has known that there is a court order. He has told everyone he's not complying. Where we stand at the moment, the question is whether he should be imprisoned. Another 30 days changes nothing. He has been served with papers, he has not responded. So another 30 days simply enables the abuse of the constitutional court to continue. And the abuse of this court should stop. It can only stop by a custodial sentence, not by another 30 days of allowing him to think what else he wants to say about the court. Now on the custodial sentence, how do you arrive at the two years imprisonment that you seek? Yes, thank you, uh, Justice Mtland. If I can start, I mean, perhaps the, 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 the useful uh, part of, the, of our heads of argument is uh, when we try to explain this, uh, this period. Firstly, we are not aware uh, of authorities that deal with this similar situation. We couldn't find useful precedents. Uh, I think the, 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 the longest period that is contained in legislation is a period of three years and, sorry, a period of 15 years. And this we, you will find at paragraph, at footnote 50. But those are legislative provisions where witnesses have not complied with the summons. They move from six months, 12 months, three months, two to five years, 15 years, generally speaking, of witnesses not complying with the summons. But those could probably serve as a guide, but they can never be conclusive. This case is not about a summons, it is about a contempt of court. The question is, what is the duration of incarceration that would serve the object of this court ensuring 
that its orders are not in the future disobeyed. Now, we would say what you should take into account here to impose two years, which is a serious penalty, is the position of Mr. Zuma, his seniority as former president, his political standing and influence in society. That weighs in a great deal. You should also take into account the forceful and public nature of his disobedience. I don't want to repeat Mr. Zuma's insults to this court. They are egregious insults to members of the judiciary as a whole, to Justice uh, Mlambo, who is the judge president of the uh, uh, North Houghton Division, to the institution of the judiciary. It is egregious insults. But they are also made in a public and a forceful way, akin to a campaign, a campaign to discredit the judiciary. That is another factor you should take into account. You should also take into account... Ngugai, tell me, sorry to interrupt you, but doesn't any person have the freedom of speech to criticise this court? They do. Yes. And wouldn't, wouldn't we be impinging on Mr. Zuma's freedom of speech if we have to take what he says about this court as aggravating circumstances? There is no one who is entitled to insult falsely and untruthfully the constitutional court. Everyone is entitled to say the judges are wrong. Everyone is entitled to say that the judgments do not follow the law. But there is no one who is entitled to say that the judges have abandoned they are green robes. No one is entitled to say that the, some judges have received money from Mr. Ramaphosa. No one is entitled to say that the constitutional court has become a threat to democracy. No one is entitled to say that the judgment of the constitutional court mimics the posture that has been adopted by the commission, which is designed um, to make unfair judgments against Mr. Zuma. That is not criticism. That is not a debate. Those are plain insults. They are false. They are unfounded. They cannot be justified. Mr. Zuma is not even here to complain about his freedom of speech. He is quite happy that he has made his remarks because they fall in the category of political campaigns. So we are all entitled to say the judges are wrong. We say that all the time when we come on appeal before this court. But we are never entitled to embark on ad hominem attacks against people that are doing their job honestly, diligently, to the best of their knowledge. And if this is not stopped, there will be discredit to the court and there will be discredit to the institution of the judiciary. So this is not a case about freedom of speech. This is a case about a deliberate campaign to discredit the court. And it must be seen as such, period. Mr. Ngaitobi, if I may take you back to the appropriate remedy. Um, what yes. is the problem with a remedy that incorporates or gives an alternative to imprisonment, a fine as an alternative to imprisonment? What's wrong with that? because it does not give appropriate weight to the harm. And it does not appropriately vindicate the authority of the court. And it ultimately reduces the assault to the dignity of the court into a money exchange. Now that is just inappropriate. What the amicus suggests, is even on its own conceptualization of the case, is that he must first go to prison. And once he has gone to prison, if he changes his mind, he should then be brought back to the commission. But even that brings about discredit to the court because it will be ineffective. It cannot be effective in the context of what Mr. Zuma has said. Not when he has been given a chance to explain. One of the judge judgments we came across, uh, Justice Pillay, one of the judgments we came across, I think it must be as versus Mamabolu, says that the fact in a contempt of court application, 
the fact that you treat the judges with so much disdain that you don't even bother to file an answering affidavit. Sorry, it was not uh, Mama Bulo, it was uh, a co compensation commissioner. It was an SCA judgment involving the compensation commission in 2016. One of the factors the judges took into account was the fact that in a contempt of court application, you don't even bother to file an answering affidavit, not to justify your conduct, but to explain it is itself a sufficiently aggravating factor justifying incarceration. So what we have here, we've got this political campaign based on falsehoods, not explained, and then no appearance today. And we are now debating whether or not something less than incarceration should in fact be imposed. So the question really is how long should Mr. Zuma go to prison for? That he should go to prison should be clear. Mr. Nguye Toby, whilst on the remedy, um, at paragraph 59 of the main judgment, it appears that this court has already made an observation on the steps that the commission, uh, coercive steps taken by the commission. If one reads that paragraph 59 says, this is a classic example of the commission invoking its coercive powers. Yes. The question that arises is whether the current situation in which the commission finds itself would have arisen if it had timely invoked its powers of compulsion. Yes. And this requires us to look at steps taken by the commission over time. What should we make of this observation in view of the remedy that we have to look at? Yes, thank you, uh, Justice Lange. So thank you for the question. Um, yes, that shows that any other opportunity right now of purported compliance will be met either with resistance or derision because it has been tried before, it has not worked. The ultimate judicial pool in circumstances such as this is incarceration. It must be exercised you know, despite the fact that Mr. Zuma says, basically is using the language of daring the court I'm not afraid of going to prison. So it shows that paragraph 59, that even prior to coming to the court in December, 2020, the commission had tried to use its coercive powers. I know there's criticism in the judgment that uh, he was given a leeway, which would not be ordinarily given to other witnesses. But the fact is that the coercive powers were tried, they didn't work. There's no scope for further coercive powers. The only scope that remains now is imprisonment. So we would then say, Later, you before, you, before you move on, um, in response to my sister, Justice Pile, you referred to uh, Compensation Commission. Yes, yes, yes Justice. Uh, or Commissioner. Commissioner, uh, yes. That uh, case and what you say about it uh, seems to be relevant to an issue that was bothering me and uh, which I wanted to raise and uh, raise it with uh, fair trial considerations in mind. Um, what I had in mind was whether in your research you have come across a situation where uh, the party sought to be held in contempt has not participated at all in the proceedings yes. and how uh, courts then handle that situation if uh, they indeed found the person to be in contempt. Uh, did they just go ahead and uh, uh, hand down the sanction or did they stop at that point, send out something that says, something similar to saying, we have now convicted as it were. And then do you want to say anything on, 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 on the sanction? and then the court deciding the question of sanction uh, down the line. Uh, how in your research have courts handled that situation? Yes, um, Justice Matlanga, I've now found the relevant paragraph I was talking about. The judgment is called Compensation Solutions, PTY LTD versus the Compensation Commissioner. It's the, the, the softly reference is 2016 ZA SCA 59. In paragraph 20, the judges say the following. This narrative, that's they're talking about the consistent breaches of the order. 
the commissioner's persistent and unexplained breaches of the settlement order and the flouting of the court accords directives in various proceedings. It shows the utter disdain of the commissioner, a senior state official entrusted with a vitally important social welfare responsibility and vast public funds unnecessarily wasted by his persistent contemptuous conduct for the court, its procedures and its orders. And then they say the worst affront to the court is that he could not even be bothered to explain himself why he repeatedly failed to comply with his order. Thus, he placed no facts before the court, a quo, establishing reasonable doubt that his non-compliance with the settlement order was not willful and malafide. I can only agree with the appellant that the commissioner's conduct was scandalous and deserving of the strictest, strictest censure possible. It proved its case warranting his committal to prison beyond reasonable doubt. So in that case, they say your persistent breaches and your failure to explain simply shows that you should in fact go to jail rather than any other alternative penalty. So that's the best authority we could find similar to what has transpired. Although what has transpired is still egregious because of the insults to the, the court. So I'm afraid Justice Madlanga, there is no other special procedure to be designed. The law is clear on contempt at this point in time. And he knew what was being asked for. He knew that a sanction that was being sought was his imprisonment. Despite that, he decided not to do anything about it, not even to file a notice saying, I'm not opposing, I'm not abiding, I'm not opposing. He ignored the proceedings. In compensation commissioner, they said, the fact that you could not be bothered to explain yourself shows the disdain with which you take the institution of the judiciary. And therefore it justifies committal. So I'm afraid to submit that uh, any other procedure that can be set up simply enables the further exploitation of the judicial process. And where matters stand right now is a direct imprisonment. Uh, Katobi, is, sorry, I, 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 this is a matter of interest. I see in that case that uh, the compensation commissioner was sentenced to three months imprisonment, suspended for a period of five years on condition that he not commit a similar offense during that period. You say yes. that sentence is inappropriate, yeah. Yes, it is totally inappropriate, yeah. I was answering a different point, which is what to make of a party's failure to file an answering affidavit whether there should be a special procedure. I'm saying there is no special procedure. You get on with the job. But in this case, we are saying that the three months, the six months, there was a letter written, they said, no, why are you sending, sending to prison for two years? Because the commission rules, the commission act, section 6-1 speaks of six months. He is going to prison for two years because he is not being charged for breaching the Commission Act. He is being charged for violating the order of the Constitutional Court. That is the simple answer. He is also going to prison for two years because he could not be bothered to explain himself or to even say that the two years is too long. So in those circumstances, the order that would appropriately show the extent of the seriousness of Mr. Zuma's conduct and the order that will show that people should not be allowed to wage political campaigns against judges, particularly where those campaigns are based on falsehoods, is a period of two years, which is a serious period, but completely well-deserved on these facts. The Last point is then the issue of costs. We have said that Mr. Zuma should pay a punitive cost. We have explained why a punitive cost is required. But the most important element is that he is acting with malice. The utterances that Mr. Zuma has made are malicious utterances. He is also acting without any facts. Mr. Zuma completely disregards the evidence. He just launches 
on an attack that is completely bereft of fact. Once you combine the malice and the untruthfulness, it becomes quite clear that a normal cost order is not sufficient, that he should pay a punitive cost order, attorney and clients, that would be an appropriate penalty in addition to sending him to jail for two years. Um, I have nothing useful to say, Justice Khampembe. Uh, that will be my address to the court. Toby, on the question of costs, a punitive cost order is usually granted against a litigant for the court to show its disapproval for the manner in which that party has litigated. Mr. Zuma has not opposed these proceedings. No, Justice, uh, Justice Terod, that itself, in a contempt against a former president, that itself is warranting of a, cost, a punitive cost order. Because what this court deserved, at least, is an explanation. It did not even get that explanation. And that failure to provide an explanation is simply part and parcel of the malicious behavior of Mr. Zuma. Mr. Latobi, you have submitted to this court that the failure to give an explanation should be taken into account in respect of the length of imprisonment. Yes. So must it be taken into account in respect of the length of imprisonment and a punitive cost order as well? Yes, Justice Teron, that's exactly the point I'm making. I'm saying to the court that his malicious conduct includes the failure to give an explanation to this court about what he has said about the political campaign that he has embarked upon against this court. And it includes the fact that after he has been called upon to explain himself as the former president, he decided that he won't explain himself. That is also part and parcel of the deliberate and the calculated strategy to discredit the court. So it's relevant on both the length of the imprisonment and it's relevant on the scale of the course. In other words, it does not make it less malicious just because he has not filed an affidavit. It in fact makes it more malicious because it shows that he had no explanation for making those remarks. And he could not even be bothered to apologize to the court. So Mr. Gaitobi, you, what you're seeking is for the court to set a precedent against waging lawfare through the constitutional and other courts. Lawfare is what you're looking for. Lawfare justice play is a respectable term. And one does not want to attach that label to this kind of uh, egregious, unjustified, untruthful conduct. This conduct falls apart from lawfare. Lawfare, in fact, will lose meaning if it is attached to this type of behavior. So what we are asking for, yes, perhaps you could if you are to expand the meaning of lawfare. But what we are asking for is that people should not wage political campaigns on falsehoods against members of the judiciary with no consequences. And here, a former president should not do that. So yes, the president is crucial, but the court needs to protect the institutional integrity of the judicial system. Um, uh, Justice Khampempe, I'm, I'm in your hands. I've, I've got nothing more useful to say to the court. Thank you, Mr. Ngugai Tobi. Uh, sorry, my, my junior seems to have sent me something. I know it's been overtaken by events. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Ngugai Tobi. Uh, judgment is reserved and the court is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Justices. Today's proceedings have concluded. The host will now terminate the meeting.